All right, hello. Uh, my name's Andy Johnson. I am head of production and game operations at Stoic. Um, hands up, who knows Stoic? Yeah, good. Hands up, who's played Banner Saga? Because I have to pop our game. Everyone enjoy it? Yeah. All right, tell everybody else, get them to play. Steam sales coming up, go buy the game. <laughs> awesome. All right, I've done my job. Um, so I've been, I found out about this yesterday, so I haven't prepared a deck or anything, so I'm pretty f much gonna freeform this entire talk. And I put like three slides with about this amount of information on each slide. So don't worry about what's there, it's more to remind me not to waffle on too much. Um, I've been in game development since 1991. Um, I've worked on games like Sonic 2, Darksiders, a whole bunch of Disney Pixar games, um, Minecraft, just um, I worked at King as well on mobile, so I've worked on console, PC, handheld, mobile, and now I'm back on PC games. I personally like small teams, um, which is why I'm at Stoic, because it's small, like great team, really cool people I love working with, um, rather than larger teams where you're like a cog in the works, but you know, Wherever you can get a foot in the door and get into the games industry, like more power to you. All right, so, did it work? Yeah, get out of the way, that works. All right, so what is a producer? So a, um, I wanna talk a little bit about, about game producers, and can you all hear me at the back okay? All right, so uh, a game producer, um, the role has evolved over time. Like in the 20 years I've been in game development, it's gone from a, um, if you think about the movies, a game producer used to be like the director of the movie, where everything flowed through the producer, and typically in a production organization is an EP, which is executive producer, then a senior producer, and depends on the, t the size of the team, the number of these, and then producer, and then AP. So an AP can either be associate or um, assistant <coughs> producer. Um, yeah, so the producer um, role used to be like a game uh, movie director where everything flowed through you. So every decision that was made was like, you know, go this way, make the sky this blue. You know, you got artists who are coming to you, you got designers and you're saying like, fix these bugs, bugs triage, and, you know, setting scheduling, all of that stuff. The role has kind of morphed. Um, since development teams have picked up and gone from waterfall scheduling. Everyone know, know the difference between kind of vaguely about waterfall and agile? Mm. Jump through that? That all right, all right. So, so waterfall development is um, the old school way of doing it, where if you imagine you're building, it works well with manufacturing and construction. So if you're, if you're creating a building, you set a plan, you know how long it takes them to dig the, the hole for the foundation, you know how long it takes concrete to set, you've got your plan, so you start here, you do dump, 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 you get here, you have a building, you get the permits, and then you can open it up. That's essentially waterfall, where everything runs in parallel, and then it comes together at the end. And the name waterfall is because in development, it all comes together at the end and goes off a cliff, like a waterfall, and then it's all put together at that point. And then that's normally when a producer in the old style um, gets like zero sleep <laughs> because you're going through bug triage you're finding out that this system that did work in silo doesn't work with this system that it's now been put together with it was a uh, it was very messy way to um, to kind of project plan it was great for the higher-ups in the organization because you could get a lovely Gantt chart and you could predict from the beginning to the end and say this is when all this stuff's gonna get done and will be done on this date. But invariably, everything would slip or things would have to be cut. So now, um, in a more agile uh, development format, um, development teams use Scrum, which I think you guys are doing some variant, variant of Scrum, uh, where you have stand up in the morning, you have sprints, which are around a set amount of time, size, 
you have pods or scrum teams which are people that you work with consistently and the idea of scrum and agile is that you push the decision making down to the ICs the individual contributors so no longer am I the producer going how long is this going to take you I think this is going to take you this amount of time to design this out and these are the things that I think that you need to do to do it because I'm not qualified I'm not a game designer I now come to or, or someone like me scrum master would work with the teams and say you know here's a feature or a user story this is as a player as a user we want this thing to happen and then the scrum teams put it together figure out sizing so the the, the switch to that is in a production role you're now instead of mapping out an entire project plan you're now mapping out um, kind of a very loose framework of what the project's going to be and then you have a deadline of when you need to be done by it and then you're tracking teams so the producer role um, and I'll back step real quick uh, that's scrum artists sometimes work in Kanban or Kanban which is a also an agile um, methodology but that's more around manufacturing which works really well for content creators like artists so if you guys haven't looked that up look up Kanban it's great I've got a t-shirt um, so in the new agile uh, world producers have kind of morphed almost into and it's not the same on every development team in every studio but the producer role has kind of morphed into more like a team secretary and it's more like a, a, a team I don't want to say assistant because that's kind of too demeaning but more like a, a helps a team to unblock the team and then the team is the power that pushes through whereas before it was like producer almost pulling teams along right so it's much more team focused and team powered um, there are multiple different names for a producer there's producer you know assistant associate producer senior uh, program manager is another one project manager is used on games as well and then product manager these are all important things that you're here in every single development team in every studio in every studio in every dev team they're used in different ways so in one place program manager will supersede a producer um, in other places a program manager will be a sub to a producer so there's no and I've had lots of discussions with people on LinkedIn about what is the definition behind each one nobody can agree um, a product manager is the only difference a product manager is more um, is more product focused so they look into user behavior how and I hate saying users player behavior sorry how players are spending um, how to um, incentivize players engagement retention um, uh, lifetime value of players all of this terminology is like a product manager kind of realm and then they'll decide from a product point of view um, what features should be made and then a producer and a dev team will work with that that person what have I got next what do they add to the team okay so how many here have been on a team making something of uh, with a team size of like maybe three or four or more okay so how many of you have lost work communications gone down um, you've found out at the end that somebody's done something you're like oh crap that doesn't match with what I've done you've like blown past deadlines like you didn't believe okay <laughs> pretty much everybody so how many of you on a team have had one person step up and be like I'm gonna organize stuff you need to talk to you and you need to talk to you that's a producer role production role right so that's kind of what I do but taking myself out of the development on the teams that you've worked on uh, the teams where you've had someone do that have they been more successful generally than the teams where everyone just pretty much worked in silo I'll take that as like a yeah yeah all right so the producer role um, and what they add to the team is instead of having like a key engineer or a art lead or somebody who's key to like asset generation or um, you know key to coding a, uh, a particular feature or a game designer and taking that person away from 
when they're most powerful and they can give the most impact on, on the project, on the game. You instead, you have somebody who's totally detached from that. They may come from that background and understand that area slightly, somewhat, hopefully, if they've been doing it for a while. Um, you then have someone who's detached from that who can do that management, and that, that's kind of the production role. So the value out of having a, a producer type on, on a team is really to make sure that communication happens between not only team members, but you might be working with a publisher and like people external. If you're working on console, you need to be talking to Nintendo, Microsoft, Sony. You know, if you're working on PC, you need to be talking to Steam, GOG, get all the approvals ready, make sure the achievements hook, you know, there's all this list of things that needs to happen. Creating that list, making sure it happens, comes away from the dev team and lets them do hopefully the thing that they can do. So that's the kind of value add to having a producer on a team. Don't worry, I'm gonna blast through these pretty quick and then open it up for questions. Uh, so the function during development of a producer is um, varies over the project length. Like at the inception of the project when you're in pre-production, everything's like super squishy, right? You can't say um, the game design, initial game design or feature design is gonna take X amount of time because you don't know what it is you're designing out, right? So the, the game producer role kind of takes a step back somewhat early in the project I just make sure that the creative types are doing what they're supposed to be supposed to be doing, getting to an end goal of we need a design or we need a lockdown um, deliverable that we can we can everyone can work against by this date. So otherwise, what tends to happen is creative types will go like this way, and they'll be like, "Oh, I want to do this thing," and blah blah blah, and it looks really cool. And then you come back to them, you check in, and it's totally you know off course of where you want to be, and you've burnt like two, three sprints months even a year you know and that's development time and cost um, and everything in development should in the back of your head be thinking like there's a cost associated with this every every day burnt is like the entire development team has burnt time and that cost there's there's a uh, you want to keep your development team and your studio going like when you get in a dev team and the most important thing I can say to you is make sure you add value to that team like every day, right? You wanna be pushing the project along or following the lead of somebody else. You don't want the project to get side railed or get cut. You don't want to go down a rabbit hole that costs like multiple millions of dollars and then find that your team is suddenly, you know, on another project. You know, that's the worst thing that can happen in development. It happens every day. So that's kind of the role of, uh, producer during the beginning of the development phase. And then as development continues on, you're really specking and planning out and making sure the team's on track, checking in, removing roadblocks, right? That's the biggest kind of value add that I think I'd provide for the team is like, what what's blocking you today? What's, what's stopping you from being able to do your work or us get to this goal? Um, and then also like incentivizing the team, being like, come on, you've done a great job, you know, just really being that cheerleader for the team. I take that as a personal thing that I do, try and like make sure that the development team is fun because we're making games, right? So it should be fun, even though it's a job, it should still be something you want to do when you come into the office every day. Um, so be that stress relief as well. And then as we get to the end of the project and, and you're getting closer, like in the last six months or year of the, of the game depending on how big it is then you're really like gaining clarity and making sure that everything comes together you're liaising with like QA localization I think you had Kate Edwards here a little while ago right talking she knows tons about localization and um, <coughs> uh, culturalization making sure that excuse me that um, platform holders are happy that you're going through bug triage every day which um, is my favorite thing to do. It's very dull, but it has to be done. You have to make sure that you go through uh, scrum ceremonies. If you're doing that every day, make sure that meetings are set up and then you get to the end of the game and the game's released. And then you have to um, make sure that you're checking in with everyone. So a great example of this is Banner Saga 3 was released this year, back in July, I think 28th. Like as, as a producer type, everyone was like, we freaking released it. I was coming in on the bus and I'm like, 
all you know boy buoyed up and super happy and i'm like we just got this game out of the door day and date super complicated all these languages all these platforms coming in on, on the bus and i see that players are having a problem you know immediately like day one i don't even get into work right i don't get to celebrate with everybody we're having our stand up stoics in two locations in um seattle and austin and everyone's like high-fiving on stand-up and i'm like okay i've got to go i've got to fight this fire you know that's that's what a producer does and then figure out what the problems are speak to the team members and make sure that you can like pass it out to everybody andy what were the primary problems like what sort of things i mean it started to feel a lot <laughs> or there were just one or two so specifically like banner saga is a super complicated game um it's a norse mythology based like imagine lord of the rings is is three movies right but it's one story so that's banner saga um it was one of the first kickstarted games successfully kickstarted games and john and arnie and alex pretty much did it all on their own on banner saga one um your gameplay through banner saga one which is non-linear it's an rpg and you, decisions you make will have a direct impact on your gameplay so you'll lose like major characters. I've got a character in my playthrough I've not, not seen for like, since the 10 minutes of the game because he fell down a chasm and other people are like, he's so like, yeah, he's so awesome. And I haven't seen this character. So it's a non-linear branching game with relationships. <coughs> you get to the end of Banner Saga 1, you finish that, then you can migrate your save data, your game across to Banner Saga 2 and pick up and continue with the characters and the relationships you've built in Banner Saga 1. As you go through Banner Saga 2, get to the end of that, then Banner Saga 3, you can take your save game, migrate it to Banner Saga 3, and it has all that data from 1, 2, and 3. Essentially, console players were not able to migrate their save data across, which is like a major function, and it was a big QA misstep. These things happen, the most important thing is like communicate out to the players that we know about it and we're actioning on it. And I think it was released on like the Tuesday and we had the patch in with Sony, Microsoft and Nintendo by like Thursday and I think it was up for PS4 on like Friday or Saturday and Xbox takes longer and then Nintendo is like about a week or two weeks later. Um, we have had some other issues as well which we're working on right now. Uh, complexities of games, right? So decisions that are made in in making banner saga one some variables were not put in the game to be carried over <laughs> to banner saga two and then as we get to banner saga two who's like worked on a development project and then like kind of pivoted decisions slightly we got to banner saga three yeah and then we decided that we needed this information which wasn't carried across in the save because the variable wasn't pulled across so then we had to like infer that this thing happened because this person and this person are in the party so that means they didn't die at this point so this probably happened for most people so then that decision pulled across so <coughs> banner saga is an extremely uh complicated game because of all the moving parts and the variables and stuff so um i put this up because i thought this would be pertinent to you guys how do you become a producer Every time I do a talk, I have someone come up to me at the end and say, I want to become a producer. And I'm like, it's not super easy. So you are responsible for you know, any decent sized game, multiple millions of dollars of game, like possibly tens, twenties, hundreds, depending on what you're working on. Um, and also for all the people on your team, right? So you need that experience. The, the way that I got into being a producer was the way I kind of fell into it was I started out in QA more or less um, as a lead QA tester and then was noticed by just knowing what was going on in the game, talking to producers and being that touch point for producers to come back to and say, you know, where's the game at, what's going on? And just giving them like a little bit more information than they would were always expecting. And then just super lucky, it's back in the nineties, um, a producer said, oh, we've got this couple of like master system game gear old sega platforms um games that are going on looney tunes games why doesn't aj try them out and i was like oh i don't know what i'm doing yeah fine whatever so that's how i got into game into game production and since then i've bounced between production qa manager i've managed localization 
and I kind of bounce between those roles. That's why I also do the operation stuff. So my recommendation is if that's a track you want to get to, like a production track, either um, try and get, if you're like, you want to go on an art track and become an art producer, then make sure you know your field, right? Get in to a team, talk to the producers, you know, don't be, don't be like annoying to them, but when they come and they want to ask questions, be the person that knows the answers, right? And then over time, they'll, they'll recognize that and they'll be like, oh, this person has really helped. And then, you know, I'm a great believer and if you do good work and, you know, you're solid and you're not a douche, then it kind of goes, it helps. Um, if you want to get into like full on production, then QA is a great way to go. You just have to make sure that you are not in a QA pit where you're essentially in a room like this with just rows of tables and you don't you don't get recognized. Um, go in, if you can get into a QA lead role, that's great because um, you see how everything breaks really quickly. <laughs> you see all the broken stuff in the games and you see how it's fixed and you see how um, how uh, the resolution happens, what the touch points are, and then you can kind of really get that, that fast track knowledge of, of how to fix things. And then also like do a lot of studying online, like look up how to do agile, scrum management, Kanban, waterfall, you know, project management stuff. So you really have that rounded side as well. Um, that's, that would be my suggestion. So how do we do? Was that about half an hour? Good enough. All right. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about Vader um, Saga's three kind of um, development because mm -hmm. it got kickstarted at Meta. It meant like double its full kickstarted. On Banner Saga 1, right? Or Banner Saga uh, 3? Banner Saga 3. Okay. No, reverse. We came in early. Oh, okay. Well, we, it was, uh, I hadn't joined uh, Stoic at that point, but on Kickstarter, they said it would come out in December 2018. Oh, okay. And we came in out in okay. July. So, yeah. So, 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 yeah. I was going to ask, um, since it's a Kickstarter game and you're not really dealing with like, a publisher or a producer that's giving you money, you're kind of working with money that was given to you through your party through like, crowdfunding. Early release, there's no decisions. You just yeah. tell people and they're like, that's great. Yeah. Um, so Stoic, uh, we do have a publisher. Oh. Versus Evil is our publisher. Oh, right. So um, I'm not super au okay fait with like Kickstarter and stuff. That's more like John and Zeb and those guys. <clears throat> but my understanding is that um, Kickstarter now is more about building community. There is a lot of management that goes into all the pledges and all the rewards that come. So you pretty much burn whatever revenue you get from Kickstarter, you pretty much burn in the management of that side of things. It's more about com building community now. Um, does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. yeah? Okay, all right. Mm-hmm. So, so we're, we're in a world now of games as a service, right? So no game is fire and forget anymore, like nothing. Um, every single game has DLC, has patches. Um, and if, if you're on a console, <coughs> then that, that's pretty much all you have. You'll have a content update, or maybe you'll have new missions. You have a patch will, which will come in with fixes. If you're on games as a service, <coughs> games as a service model is you release, your game and that's when the hard work starts then you have to do incremental updates make sure that the community is going make sure that everything's running because you're hoping that if your game is successful it's like a five to ten year game so that that mentality of your project is done i'm rolling off onto the next thing is like old school um, 
So that's good and bad because uh, how, how many here know of the word horrible word crunch? Yeah, you, you're not. You should all know about crunch if you're in. Yeah. So crunch to me is like 12 hour days plus, right? No, people who do 10 hour days is like just whatever. That's normal. Um, so the problem with games as a service is if you crunch or, or you push really hard to get to that point, there's no no time for R and R afterwards for you to like recoup. So when I worked on um, the Disney Pixar games for the first Cars movie, I literally crunched um, 16 probably hours a day for nearly a year. And I was a basket case by the end of it, right? I would go out to eat and I had what's called decision atrophy, where I couldn't like make any decisions. I couldn't read a menu. Uh, just point, I'd give the menu to my wife like on the weekend when I had like some free time and I'd be like, just pick for me because I can't make it. And servers thought if she was a horrible woman. <laughs> She's, why are you like picking for him? You control him? But uh, no, I just had decision atrophy. Um, but games as a service now, you have to, as a producer type, like a good producer should be able to balance that, right? There's always going to be a push at the end of a project where you want to get done, you want to polish, you want to get the best, the best work out that you can. Um, and you have to balance that with fixing bugs and quality, like from the player point of view, you know, does it feel right, is it balanced? But then also with the release date. But then after that point, like immediately after, you're looking at like, what are the fixes, what are the fixes? So, slight related tangent for Banner Saga, and for most game releases now, you always have a day one update, right? Every game you go in, you're like, day one update. You buy the game, like Red Dead. I put the disc in and I'm like, is that 100 gig or something? Ridiculous, I don't know. I just went out walking dogs. Um, so there's always a day one update and that's because like getting to a release is really, really tough. And, and then getting through submission and approvals is, is super tough. You just, essentially, you get the best game you can at that time and then you submit it and, and if you're on consoles and make sure it can get through submission with the caveat that you're doing a day one update which is that that like continuing work afterwards, um, but balance is is a big thing. Uh, you mentioned with like uh, your crowdfunding <coughs> mm -hmm. that there you know is it's to build the community yeah. around Banner Saga. Uh, how is the community around Banner Saga? There is a community. <laughs> I like to find the question like how uh, number or, or no like how like like uh, like are they like. A, that's really difficult to measure I don't think like community is one of those really tough things it's not necessarily a measurable some people will argue with me it's not necessarily a, a measurable thing so here, here's mm -hmm. an anecdote for you like here's something that went on so Banner Saga 1 uh, which I wasn't on I joined um, midway through Banner Saga 3 Banner Saga 1 John Arnie and and, and um, John, Arnie, and Alex, the game was crowdfunded, right? They were like, this is awesome, we got the money to make the game, they made this game, and it was like, really good game, go buy it, Steam sale if you haven't got it, super plug. Um, <laughs> so they made the game, and the community really exploded around it due to Kickstarter, due to just being such a great game. So they, they, they thought after that point, and I did a talk uh, on a panel recently about this, um, like great our, our community our players just want us to like shut the doors you put your hand out I come after this um, they just want us to make the next game as quick as possible so they went dark for like two years and made Banner Saga 2 they found that the um, community actually waned because they didn't have any community management they weren't uh, like actively going out and talking with community we weren't running like discord or whatever was running back then so um, and I think that impacted the initial launch of Banner Saga 2. So since that point, we've had a community manager and we've been really, really community focused. It's very difficult to measure like what the impact of that is. Um, similar to measuring what the impact of quality assurance is. If the game's bug free, why am I testing it? You know, you can't say what, how much testing is, is right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kind of vaguely. 
I can chat after a bit more if you want. <laughs> How would I hire someone? Yeah. Like now in, uh, as opposed to when? For which role? It's really tough because personally, like I go off, I, I like to hire people that I've worked with before, personally. So it's really tough for you guys, right? Because like I haven't met you. Nice hat by the way, but like <laughs> other than that, I don't know, right? I don't know what the quality of your work is. So if you're if you're an artist, or um, make sure your portfolio is robust and tight. Um, networking connections are really really important. You know, don't don't be annoying about it. You know, where you're running up to people. Some people just don't like to network at all. Like, and and I believe in what I'm doing now is super important because I wouldn't be here if people back in the day didn't take a chance on me. Right. So me coming to talk to you guys is like paying it forward. Other people don't think that way. But, but you know, take every opportunity you can to meet people in the industry, show them your work, show them that you're interested in doing it and capable, and, and within reason, don't say no, right? You don't, you don't want to take a position that isn't gonna pay the bills. Like, you don't wanna do free work, but if, if there's some work that you can do that will get your foot in the door at something that's gonna, gonna promise like further career movement, then that's super important. There's no like tried and tested way to get your foot in the door though. You know, that, uh, what I will say is now, because of like awesome places like this, as opposed to when I started, when video games were for nerds and kids and nobody played them, um, it's much, I think it's much tougher for you guys to get in the industry now than it was when I just stumbled in. Um, so, you know, make sure your portfolio is robust, work your network, you know, make sure you go to meetups, make demos. Demos are a great way to get noticed as well. Like team up with people, make a demo, um, something that, that designers, if you're in design, can get their hands on and see, you know, that, that tangible stuff is super important. So is it like a conscious decision to become a producer? <coughs> I think yes. I think leadership is probably the wrong word though because um, a lot of people think they're a good producer and they're not. They, I think soft skills are more important than being like a strong leadership person, if that makes sense. Like if you've got an engineer who has like worked a ton of hours and is crispy and they have to hit a deadline. So when I was working on previous games, I cannot as a producer give you a financial reward, right? I'm just picking on you because you're at the front. I cannot as a producer give you a financial reward. What's your incentive to listen to me when I'm saying this has to be done by this date, right? I got creative and I said to the team, if you hit this milestone, my wife loves me by the way, <laughs> you hit this milestone, my wife will bake you a cake, the whole team. And I'm like, Paul, what cake do you want? You know, just some dumb thing, right? And it became a thing. Like this team started hitting every single freaking day because they're like, <laughs> I want a cake. At the Christmas party, my wife didn't know anybody and everyone's, you're the cake lady, you're the greatest. You know, so that, that like soft skills and, and really uh, being human about it is for me super important. And that's how I've got through. And there are other producer types that, that bully and shout and intimidate and, you know, and jump from one team to the next team. And that to me isn't sustainable. Sustainability is what, it's, what it should be about. 
yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a, unabatedly. Um, and if you can do it in a way where you grin about it and uh, everybody knows that's what you're doing and they're fine because they get cake, then that's even better. But you do. You have to it's either that or you you either lead from the front or you push and kick from the back. And like I'd much rather, you know, lead. <laughs> But lead from the front, like with cake and you know just comedy and like let's get it together and we need to hit this date, than be that person that's at the back like shouting and you know you guys suck and you didn't hit the last sprint deadline and your freaking delivery is a crap and your release is broken. You know, be like, what can we do to improve this? No, you're right. I haven't worked at those places. Um, then how, is, how does that work in that regard? Like, say, like, so that person is you as the producer, why is it that you just try to keep happening? Because they keep getting rewarded for it, right? Because we all love, re like, I don't know what went on. Let's not, let's not say, let's not speak ill about Red Dead, because I love that game, it's so good. But, um, like if we take LA, LA Noir as an example, right? Team Bondi, I think, made LA Noir, and that, if you read the reports on what went on there, it's horrible, right? And yet it came out, and everyone was like, those groups, this game's amazing, you know, got fantastic reviews. I don't know the answer to, you know, what, what makes that game come out so well, treating people so, you know, not so great. For me personally, I don't want to be associated with that. So I try to work with teams and people that I want to have a long-term relationship with. Um, as a relationship may sound a little strange, but I, I want to have a sustainable like work, coming to work, noticing guys year and year. And that's important to me. So, you know, you may have to put your foot in the door and work in somewhere like that as a step up, but I, I'm, don't want to be associated with that. So that's, I think. What's the process for submitting updates? That's like a two-day talk. Uh, <laughs> so, like submitting a full console game. Um, if you're doing a physical release, will take three months from submission to release if you're doing a physical box copy you have to make sure the game's ready um, tons of paperwork like you won't believe fortunately I don't have to do that as somebody else's job um, you'll get kicked at least once for things that everyone will be like there's a period in the wrong place or a line break in the wrong place but the game's crashing well it's fine that the game's crashing but you're kicked because this one sentence is not correct it has a you know TN instead of a registered trademark um, and then it will take manufacturing is about another month or so give or take and then distribution is like another month after that so it's like a three month time frame from first submission to on the shelves if you're doing a digital distributed game um, again like going through first party like Sony, Microsoft uh, Nintendo, timelines differ like Nintendo tends to be a lot longer but you know similar thing you can be like a month month and a half from submission to release or possibly longer it's it's a very long process it's too big a question <laughs> yeah yeah uh, I was program I won't say the game but I was program manager on a data science team I did not like that that was not my bag. Um, it was all, I learned a lot of things, but it was all broken pipelines and everyone just came to me complaining because everything was broken all the time. That was not something I enjoyed. Uh, I really enjoy working at Stoic, not because it's where I'm working at right now and it's my, my current role, but the people that I work with are just great and that's what makes it really good for me. So for me, it's about like team and so. Andy, how do you get through those things that aren't as positive? Like when you're just Suck like, it up. Yeah. <laughs> really Suck it up. 
and then look for something else. If you if you wake up in the morning and you dread going to work, that's a moment you need to look for something else, in my opinion. And that that looking for something else can be dependent on your skill level, like your caliber, um, what area you're in can be between like two weeks to six or nine months. Um, so I I left, I was laid off from, you get laid off a lot as well, so you have to make sure you have a plan for that. So I was laid off from one game, uh, one team, because for reasons, it happens, and I had another job to go to pretty much the next week, just because I'd like networked and I saw it come in. Um, I was laid off, <laughs> I was at 38 Studios and it imploded, and it took me six months to get another gig. So uh, you just have to be prepared, but equally you have to be all in on what you're working on as well. So it's... Even if you don't like it, you know even if Yeah, yeah, you, you have to yeah, do good stuff. Like even if you don't like where you're at or the role, like do good stuff so you can be recognized for, for whatever you're doing next. And you never know it's a small industry, don't worry. I'm, it's a small industry, so you never know where that dude is going to be or, or that, that person's going to be that you worked with in like six months, two years, three, four, five years. The majority of the jobs that I've gotten um, have been through recommendations from people I've worked with previously. So that to me is key. It's not like I spent six months sending my resume out, pretty much like just a few interviews here and there, but like most of my jobs have been through uh, referrals for people that I've worked with previously. So that network is like super important. Can't stress that enough. Uh, Sorry. So if you go from producer like to actual producer, is there like a difference? Yeah. Well, well, it depends. Like producer like to. Yeah, like you're almost like, or it shows you have potential to be producer, but you know, it's like you're working on the work and stuff. It should be. It, uh, you should. <laughs> Now, majority of people, unless they're contract, um, which a lot of art positions, um, a lot of IC individual contributor positions are contract. Uh, most other positions are salary, so you don't get you don't get paid overtime or anything. I come up with. Uh, you don't get paid overtime after that, and you should should get a pay bump when you move up. But what can happen in development teams is people will start taking like you'll have a. QA lead that will start taking on all this extra responsibility and then they become the de facto AP and then people are very comfortable keeping them in that position but then that's up to that person to then like get to the point where they're they feel empowered to say like I need like you need to promote like put me in a role that I should be in uh, do uh, <coughs> uh, producers have uh, any creative input on the project they're working on because they are kind of different from designers? Yeah, not really. Um, it depends. Like, I will... It depends. Very rarely do I get time to play all the way through the games that I'm working on, like, in a linear fashion because I'm just... So many other fires and things are going on. But I will give feedback on things where I'll pick it up and I'll be like this doesn't feel right or you know we need to like this this UX flow is we can remove a button click by just you know making this a single click rather than click click. You don't like work on like stories or anything like that? Right? Nah, but I'll give feedback on stuff because I, I, I always try and be like player advocate as much as possible which I think everyone on the dev team should be and um, Stoic's a great place because like feedback is just accepted from everybody. A lot of places are very um, like stringent and rigid about like you are this position, you don't get to give feedback on that. Does that kind of make your job like harder knowing that you don't really give <coughs> or you don't really have a huge impact in the creative side of things? I've been doing it for like ever so I'm used to it. I, 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 I feel like my contribution is is making sure that the people who make those decisions are unblocked. I'll be in, um, 
I'll be in design meetings and stuff with them and then we'll be riffing and like give feedback and stuff like that but I'm not actually doing designs or okay. building stuff out I think that yeah, yeah. So, uh, I'm afraid that's our oh. time uh, oh okay so, uh, so give, yeah, give cool. the man a hand please